So in our last video, we talked about how we pay for medications and introduced the concept of both a copay and a deductible. And just for reference, I'm going to draw that here again. And that copay in our example was about $10. And the deductible in that example was about $400. So I'll write that here as well. Now, we asked another question, which is, which is, why so complicated? What is the purpose of having these copays and deductibles? Because it kind of makes it really hard to know how much you owe for medications. And the answer is it's, it's very complicated to pay for medicines because medicines themselves are very complicated. They can come in different forms, and we'll talk about that. And you also as a patient have many different choices. So let's start with the different forms. So suppose you work at a drug company and you're trying to figure out high blood pressure, we'll abbreviate that HTN, how to treat hypertension. So you're in the laboratory, you discover this fancy new compound and you give it a name. So that's called the generic name. It's kind of just like the chemical name of a new drug that you've discovered. And in this case, let's call it furosemide. And it turns out that in the laboratory, this works really well. It helps lower blood pressure. And maybe even in big studies, it actually saves lives. So you go ahead and you go to the Food and Drug Administration and they say, that's great, you can sell this drug, it's been approved. So as a company, you then give that compound a brand name. In this case, furosemide was given the brand name of Lasix. And it turns out that Lasix works really well, it, it helps lower blood pressure, saves lives, all that kind of stuff. So after several years go by, Lasix is still available, but it turns out that the patent that the company had after several years goes ahead and expires. So other people are now allowed to make furosemide as well. And so they put it into pills and they sell it as well. Now remember, Lasix, furosemide, other furosemides are exactly the same thing. Pretend you're going to the supermarket and you buy bottled water. Bottled water is pretty much the same, doesn't matter what kind you buy. However, the people that first created bottled water probably came up with a fancy name, you know, Crystal Palace Lake or something like that. But it's really no different than the bottled water other companies make. However, because Crystal Palace Lake got there first, they've really built up brand identity, they charge a lot of money for their product. Just like people who first discover a medication, they give it a brand name, they initially have premium pricing. People understand that. Many people may not even understand that Lasix and furosemide are exactly the same thing. So other people to compete will charge less. So they'll say, hey, we didn't have to invest all that money in research and development. We can now make furosemide. It's just cheaper. Now, imagine you're a patient or you're an insurer. Do you want to pay the high price here, or would you prefer to pay the lower generic price for medications that are exactly the same? Now, if you're a patient, it really doesn't matter to you if your insurance just pays all the costs. You probably just say, you know, I don't really care. I'll just go ahead and get the laces. But remember, then your insurance company is paying a lot of money. They're paying three times, four times, five times the price for medications. So they want you to buy the cheaper version. So this is one way where what a insurer or company would do is to say, well, you know what? If you buy the generic form of this, you'll have to pay a lower copay or potentially even no copay. So they might say, hey, if you get the generic form of furosemide, maybe you just have to pay $5. And because it's cheaper, then the insurance company saves a lot of money. On the other hand, if you're determined to get the fancy form or the brand name form, maybe the copay for that would be like $25. So as a consumer, you certainly would rather pay $5 and not have to pay $25. And so they steer you to get the generic form. And remember, because the actual medicine may cost dozens of dollars, the insurance company also saves a lot of money because their proportion of what they pay is much lower.
Now let's talk about another situation, which is that here with furosemidelases, we talked about exactly the same thing. But hypertension is a complicated problem, and there's many different medications. So you might have medication pill A here, which actually works in a completely different way. It's a completely different substance than pill B. Maybe pill A reduces blood pressure by relaxing the blood vessels in your body, whereas pill B works by maybe just lowering your heart rate or something like that to kind of lower the work on your heart. They don't do exactly the same thing. However, there's obviously they're different products, and so they actually get priced differently as well. And maybe it turns out that pill A has been on the market for many, many years. And so there actually is a cheap generic form of pill A. And maybe that only costs, say, $20 for your supply. Whereas pill B was just discovered, you know, fancy new ad campaign, and that has still under patent. So it's a brand name product, still under patent, and that actually costs a lot more. Suppose it costs $500. Now, which one should a patient have? Well, it turns out that maybe there's studies that are done, and the studies show that there's actually really no big difference. Pill A, when you take it, works great for high blood pressure, and pill B may not even be as good. In fact, the studies show that patients who take pill A actually have fewer heart attacks, their blood pressure is better controlled, and the drug is actually better, even though cheaper. Here, remember that if you're the pharmacy or the person selling the medication, you want to sell the more expensive one because your margin is probably higher. You probably make more money as a pharmacy selling pill B. That's a very different goal than if you're the insurer or the patient where what you care about is the highest value. You want something that's cheap and accomplishes the same exact thing. What if your doctor on the other hand, may not know about that, or maybe your uh, hospital you went to somehow just gave you a prescription for pill B for whatever reason, whereas you kind of ultimately really should be getting pill A. Well, what pharmacy benefit managers and insurance companies do is they actually take care of this problem by creating a concept called a formulary. So this medicine right here might be in the formulary. In other words, it's a preferred kind of categorization. So if you want this medication, the pharmacy would carry it and it would be covered. Whereas this medicine, they'd say, you know what, the studies aren't very good, it's super expensive, we're actually not even going to put it on our formulary, so that's non-formulary. So if a drug is not on the formulary, your insurance may not pay for it at all. You'd learn that and then maybe you'd call your doctor, call the hospital and say, you know what, I can't actually get that medicine. I'd like the other one. That's the one that's being approved. So in the best case scenario, by asking patients or really, to be honest, forcing them to go ahead and get this form of the medication by keeping it on the formulary, you're driving the patients to get something which is cheaper and has higher value than potentially something that's more expensive and not as um, and not really worth the extra cost, that non formulated drug, because this is not covered. So these are the ways in which benefit plans and insurance with pharmaceuticals tries to make drugs cheaper and also enhance value, and also explains why there's a super complicated system of deductibles, co-pays, and so on. I'm going to pause there for a minute and move on to something that's also very important, which is how Medicare pays for drugs, because that affects so many people and is so important. So I'm just going to go ahead and erase uh, part of our board right here, leaving up the copay and deductibles, and then go ahead and talk about Medicare Part D. So Medicare Part D was really created in 2003 with the passing of what was called 
the Medicare, Medicare Modernization, Modernization Act of 2003 for the first time created a universal prescription plan that seniors on Medicare could have. You'd pay an annual premium, uh, roughly around $400 or so, in order to sign up. And once you signed up, this is how the benefits worked. It was kind of like a partnership between the patient and Medicare or the federal government. And the way the partnership worked depended on how much you spent on your prescription drugs. Anywhere from, say, $0 per year to $3,000 got treated one way. If you were somewhere between $3,000 and roughly $4,500, it got treated a different way. And then anywhere from $4,500 and up got treated a third way. So let's talk about that a little bit. Right here, if you're between zero and three thousand dollars a year in prescriptions, like you know, you had about five or ten prescriptions, maybe you paid about two thousand dollars a year, uh, total prescription costs, Medicare here would pick up most of that. So that prescription drug benefit would pay seventy-five percent or so of the cost of any prescriptions. The patient has to pay about twenty-five percent, something like that. However, there's this weird thing between three thousand and forty-five hundred turned out that patients had to pay most of that. So that coverage was kind of dropped down quite a bit from Medicare. And then when you got to $4,500 and up, again, Medicare kicked in. And $4,500 and up, the government would sort of continue to pay for your medication prescriptions at that point. I'm just going to change this to green right here. So right here, this is sort of the, uh, the coverage area that most seniors are happy about. Right here, this place where the kind of coverage just disappeared, that vanishing coverage, that was called the donut hole. And the donut hole um, was kind of an area where you kind of had to pay up if you were a senior. However, if you spent a lot more than that, you fell into what's called the catastrophic zone. And that means that you were spending so much money that the government would start to kick in again. This, although allowed seniors to get prescriptions and most of them benefited quite a bit. If you were in this zone, there were some problems. So as of 2010, with the passing of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, there's a plan to gradually move this over here. In other words, closing the donut hole so that in several years over time, in fact, Medicare here will again start to pay the majority of those drug costs between $3,000 and $4,500 as well. So that's thought to really protect seniors. So the other thing that remains to be done and something that should be emphasized is that Medicare under law cannot bargain for the lowest drug prices. So although this benefit here is fairly generous for a lot of seniors, the federal government is not allowed to take advantage of the fact that it's such a huge buyer of medication, spending billions and billions of dollars. Medicare is not allowed to bargain for the lowest prices. This is thought to cost the government over 10 years over $150 billion in potential savings. This is in contrast, interestingly, to another government buyer of medications, which is the Veterans Administration, or the VA, which can get medications for veterans, uh, prior members of the military. They, in fact, do bargain. Um, it's a smaller piece of the pie, but gives you a sense of how much lower the prices could be, and that's where some of the estimates come from, showing what the potential savings could be for Medicare if Medicare bargained for drug prices.